as you heard in the children's sermon, there are over 600 laws in the Torah, in the Old Testament. Actually, there are 613. Now, I did not go and count every one. One, two, three. No, somebody else did it. In fact, the, the Pharisees, the Hebrew teachers, they did the counting. There are 613 commandments in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, sometimes called the Pentateuch. We all know what those books are. Say them with me. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. You see, Vacation Bible School paid off. It did indeed. <laughs> the Pharisees were scholars of the law. And they liked to establish categories for the law. So they had categories for laws dealing with aliens, categories for laws dealing with family, categories for laws dealing with other members of the Hebrew people, categories dealing for practices and behaviors relative to ritual and worship, practices and behaviors relative to work, practices and behaviors relative to cooking, to all the various features and elements of the daily life. Uh, they also categorize the law by weighty elements or weighty or important issues or laws or commandments, and those that were lighter, not so weighty, laws and commandments. The ones that were weighty were the biggies. Let's see, one really good weighty law would be thou shalt not commit murder. I assume you all would agree with me that the law against murdering is an important one, right? Right? There you go, thank you. You're awake, good. The law against committing murder is really important. Another really, it's one of the big ten. Another really important law, also part of the big ten, and very important to the Hebrew people, was the law about keeping the Sabbath day. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's one of the big ten. It's one of the weighty laws, except that, unfortunately, so frequently, we are apt to fail to keep it. Thank for me for just one moment. What, just one moment. What, what is the Sabbath day? What day of the week is the Sabbath day? Saturday. Thank you very much. Saturday. Saturday is the Sabbath day. It's the Sabbath day throughout the entire Hebrew Scriptures. It's the Sabbath day throughout the entire New Testament Scriptures. The Sabbath day is Saturday. Sunday is the Lord's Day. It's the day in which we recognize and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is the first day of the week as opposed to Saturday, which is the seventh day of the week. And we are called to remember it. Now that does not mean you remember it by saying, oops, I'm halfway through mowing the yard and I forgot to keep the Sabbath day. Nuh-uh, nuh -uh. you, you remember it to keep it holy, to keep it set apart, to keep it special. To keep it for God's sake, because the Lord rested, we are called to rest on the Sabbath day. And so important was this law that the Pharisees, the legal scholars of the day, developed all sorts of ways to determine whether or not what you needed to do could be done or not done on the Sabbath day. One of the most famous has to do with the laying of eggs. Not humans laying eggs, chickens laying eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes like this. If a chicken lays an egg on the Sabbath day, can you eat it? Lots of different theories and arguments as to whether or not you could eat an egg that was laid on the Sabbath day. But the most common answer to the question was no. You couldn't eat an egg that was laid on the Sabbath day because the chicken had to work to lay that egg. True, the chicken couldn't keep from doing it, but sorry, that's work. But you could eat the chicken that hatched from the egg that was laid on the Sabbath day. Aha! So instead of scrambled eggs, you can have Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, from that chicken that was laid on the Sabbath day. Yes, you can. Hmm, I'm not sure which I would prefer. It kind of depends on the time of day, doesn't it? 
this, these rules and regulations, these interpretations of the Sabbath day can actually be found codified in some of these 613 laws elsewhere in the Torah. If a woman gives birth to a baby, she can give birth, but she can't cut the umbilical cord until after sundown. If you break your arm, you can bind it, but you can't set it until after the sun goes down at the end of the Sabbath day. You know what? It's possible that the bone would already be knitting. You might have to re-break it in order to set it right. Ooh. Lots of rules and regulations dealing with what you could do and could not do on the Sabbath day. It's one of the big ten. It's one of the biggies, one of the weighty laws. And so it makes perfect sense that the Pharisees would come to Jesus to ask Jesus to give an interpretation of the law, to tell which was the greatest commandment of all, which was the most important law to take care of. Jesus has been tested several times already. The Sadducees came to him just a couple of verses earlier to test him, to ask him questions about the resurrection. Why? When I was in undergraduate school uh, studying religion in the Bible, I learned a wonderful way of remembering the differences between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, along with the Essenes and the Zealots and several other organizations or groups within Judaism, were denominations of their faith. Just like we got Methodists and Baptists and Catholics and Lutherans, so also they had Essenes and Sadducees and Pharisees and Zealots and other groups, other denominations of Judaism. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, the doctrines of the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees believed that when you died, you went to sleep with your ancestors, and that was it. That's all she wrote. That's all that's going to happen. You go to sleep with your ancestor David, and that's it. That's what the Sadducees believed. And the way to remember that is to say, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, therefore they were sad, you see. Oh, oh, oh. ba dum bum <laughs> Keep my day job, right? Yeah. The Pharisees... The way you remember the Pharisees and what was important to them was the Pharisees believed that you should study and keep the law. Therefore, they were fair, you see. Oh, oh but um, boom is right. But it's true. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the study and keeping of the law. Not that the Sadducees didn't believe in the law. It's that the Pharisees had systems and structures established for the study of, interpretation of, and keeping of the law, the Torah. And their entire expression of the Hebrew faith orbited around understanding, interpreting, and applying the Torah in their daily living. Hence, it makes perfect sense that they would come to Yeshua Nanzianzis, that they would come to Jesus of Nazareth, they would come to this rabbi who was himself a member of, of the Pharisaic denomination, he was a Pharisee. He was giving criticism from the inside. He's kind of like me when I say, General Conference, you're doing it all wrong. That's kind of like what Jesus was doing, except he was really doing it well. He was criticizing the Pharisaic leadership. He was telling on the outside they, they were pretty, but on the inside they were like uh, tombs full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. I kind of said that to General Conference too a few times. Nevertheless, <laughs> they came to Jesus to ask for an interpretation. And this is exactly what they would do with any rabbi, any leader of the Pharisaic party, any leader of the Pharisees. It would make sense to come to that leader, to come to that teacher, to come to that rabbi and to ask, interpret the law. That's what they did. So it makes sense that they came to Jesus. They came to Jesus to ask a classic question of a Jewish leader, to ask a classic question of a Pharisaic leader, to ask the, the classic question, which is the weightiest of all the laws? Which is the most important of all the laws? Which law has the highest importance 
for our living? Which law should we pay, be paying the most attention to? Which law is number one? And Jesus' answer is very much in accord with the practices of the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, the rabbis of his day. Jesus goes not so much to the Ten Commandments as he goes to the very core, the very heart, the very center of the Jewish faith. He goes to the very core, the very heart, the very center of the faith in his day and in the faith today. He goes to what is called the Shema in Hebrew practice. A beautiful liturgical phrase, a beautiful liturgical statement of the Hebrew people, one which we share with them. In Hebrew it goes like this, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Achad. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Or possibly, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, only the Lord. It is the core affirmation of the Jewish people. It is the core affirmation of the Hebrew people. It is the core affirmation of all those who share the Hebrew Bible as part of our scripture. It is the core affirmation that resided behind Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord alone. There is no other boss, there is no other ruler, there is no other king, there is no other president, there is no other bishop, there is no other pastor, there is no one in this universe more important than Yahweh Elohim, the Lord our God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This phrase spoke volumes to those who heard it because they knew what would immediately follow, because Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Verse 5, immediately following it, and un inseparable from it, absolutely part of it, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This affirmation of what we are called to do, because the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, the Lord is our God, because this affirmation is true, we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, Jesus is quoting straight from the very heart of the Hebrew faith. Jesus is quoting straight from the very heart of the faith of Moses and Abraham and all the prophets. And then just like any good Pharisee, he then goes and he does some extension on these remarks. He gives us the second of the weighty commandments, the one that follows immediately upon it, the one that depends upon it and yet is no less important than that one. And he draws for this one from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. After a whole sequence of rules and regulations about how one is to treat others with justice and fairness and kindness and graciousness, Chapter 19, verse 18 then says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge. Any grudge bearers here? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you shall not take vengeance. You ever try to get even? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
I am the Lord. The Lord God is saying this. Yahweh Elohim is making this statement. You cannot wiggle out of it. This is one of the weighty ones. In fact, this is the weighty one right under the weighty one of the, you shall love the Lord your God. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as if your neighbor is yourself. It's part of the definition of love which I think is central to our very living as Christians. Considering the needs of another as more important than or essential to your own needs. For your needs to be met, the other's needs to be met too. Loving your neighbor as yourself means caring for the other so much that you would rather lack for them to have. Talk about it with your kids. I know my parents, and I'm sure many of you, sacrificed a great deal so that your kids could have even when you did not. That is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. He sacrificed His only Son for us. That is what we are called to do ourselves. Set our sides and our needs, our desires and our needs aside in favor of others. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus cites this as the very core of the Hebrew faith. In this, he is placing himself in the very center of Hebraic affirmation, in the very center of Jewish religion, in the very center of Pharisaic proclamation. He then concludes his own citation and interpretation by saying, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Every other law, all the other 611 laws are interpretive and explanatory of these two. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Every other law, all 611 of them, and the prophets themselves all serve to interpret, apply these two. That makes them pretty important, doesn't it? Makes them important for the Jews and makes them important for us because Jesus selected them and identified them as the core of faith, loving the Lord our God and loving our neighbor as ourself. So much so that then when he got around to expressing his own commandment, in John chapter 15, verse 12, I'm going to repeat that because you need to know it. John chapter, and there will be a test at uh, some point in the distant future uh, at the throne of grace. John chapter 15, verse 12, this is my commandment. Now, Jesus is saying this. After having given all this interpretation over in Matthew, he now says here in John's gospel, this is my commandment. So it's got to be a big one, right? Be good? No. Be righteous? No. Don't murder? He doesn't say it at this point. No. Fill out your charge conference forms and have them in on time? No. <laughs> Obey the bishop? No. Sorry, bishop. No. Obey the, char the general conference? No. No. This is my commandment that you love one another. Oh gosh. Greg's getting on that love stuff. Jesus got on it first. This is in red lettering, friends. This is the Jesus stuff. This is my commandment that you love one another. 
That's what we're called to be about. Loving the Lord our God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Loving one another. Loving God and loving one another. You know, you spend years and years and years in seminary, years and years and years in graduate school. You study, you study, you read and you read. You learn all the theologies of all the theologians. You learn the Bible, you study the scriptures, you study the history of the church, you study the systematic theology of the faith, you earn degrees in the subject, and it comes down to something as simple as this. All of that comes down to this. Love the Lord your God with all of your being, with every bit of yourself. Don't keep anything out. All of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength or mind, all of you. God wants all of you to love God and your neighbor as yourself. And this is my commandment, Jesus says, that you love one another. We can get caught up in the discipline. We can get caught up in all the rules. We can get caught up in all theology. We can get caught up in all the structures and schemes that they may present for us for church growth and church development and all that other nonsense. When in the end, the message is simple. This is my commandment, that you love one another. We are called to be a people of love reaching out with the love and acceptance of God, reaching out with the love and acceptance of Jesus Christ, a love that knew no limitation, a love that went to the cross and died for us, a love that gives itself in resurrection for us, a love that became incarnate in human flesh for us, to show us the love of God, to share with us the love of God, so that we might share the love of God with all this is our message this is our faith in Jesus Christ this is the calling we here today have received to proclaim the love of God to proclaim the calling to love God and to proclaim the calling to love neighbor as self to reach out with the love of God for all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2014 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.